Hi, I'm Katie Adams, curator at the Tread of Pioneers Museum, and I'm here to bring you our first installment of our first virtual brown bag storytelling series. Normally these are presented in person at the museum, but this year we have opted to bring them to you in your home. I've selected some of my favorite presentations uh, from over the years. So join me each week as we select a different presentation previously recorded from our 20 plus years of putting on the brown bags. This week, in connection with the museum's newest exhibit, The Springs of Steamboat, we're bringing Danny McKinley's previously recorded talk. McKinley will tell us more about these natural wonders around our town. In 2013, McKinley wrote the book of the same title, The Springs of Steamboat. It's a great reference for your personal library. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about the Mineral Springs, you can visit mineralspringsofsteamboat.org. Further, if you'd like to see the full brown bag lineup, as well as all of our programs and tours, outdoor only, that we have offered this summer, you can visit our website. That address is treadofpioneers.org. Thank you, and enjoy! Temperatures within a couple mile radius of where we are right now. Um, and the temperatures vary in the between 40 degrees and about 150 degrees, depending on the spring. The most common minerals found in them are lithia, iron, calcium, and sulfur. And for any of you who spent any time in Steamboat, you know that sulfur smell very well. I work at the depot, so we get strong gloss on that on a daily basis. Um, we actually have three thermal springs, and those are the Old Town Hot Springs, the Sulfur Cave Spring, and the Steamboat Springs. So most thermal waters are meteoric in nature, meaning that the water comes from above, trickles down, gets heated, and then comes back upward. So steamboat's kind of located along a fault line, and they think that the waters, um, for the ones like the Strawberry Park Hot Springs, they actually go down the water to about 12,000 feet below the ground, which is where they're heated before they come back up. Um, and so with these fault lines, that's why we have a lot of springs, but if we were to have an earthquake or if we were to have a shifting of the earth, we'd probably lose a lot of the springs that we have. They'd probably go back underground. Development kind of serves that same purpose, and we'll hear some sad stories about some of our springs where they actually have trickled back under the ground. So the Ute Indians were the first settlers of this area. And they believed that water was the blood of Mother Earth. So they had a very large respect for springs and for the water. Um, and they believed that our waters had healing powers. They actually used to bathe in a lot of the springs and wear the minerals on them. Before battle, they would take their horses into the springs. And they thought that the sulfur especially would give them sure-footedness and stamina in battle. I don't know how you actually convince a horse to get into those springs, <laughs> but apparently they did. <laughs> um, and they also believe that the springs were people by um, kind of demons and things from the underworld whose purpose was, at least with the sulfur cave spring, which we'll hear about in a little bit, was to destroy and kill the people entering that realm. So James Crawford, who was our first white settler, he first heard about the springs through a hermit. And he found the hermit through an article in the paper in Missouri, which is where they were from. And he thought, I should go visit that hermit, because that's what we all think, right, when we hear about hermits. <laughs> 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 so he tried out to visit this hermit who was living off of almost nothing. In fact, his supplies were so sparse that when these visitors showed up, he hacked the tail off his mule, which was still living, cooked it, and shared it among everyone. Oh, boy. Oh, my. And as they had this very delicious dinner, <laughs> oh, um, no. he actually told James Crawford about this kind of paradise west from there that he should go and visit. So James Crawford embarked westward, and he ran into a prospector. And the prospector again told him of this beautiful area with these springs that was kind of like a paradise that he should visit. He said it did have a smell to it that was fairly strong, but it was well worth it. So James Crawford came out, um, and he decided as soon as he saw this land, this was the place that he could envision a town. He could see prosperity coming from it, and he said to his friend, this is it, right? And his friend said, I'm going home, but I will help you build a homestead so that you can stake a claim here. So they built a very basic kind of shelter, and James Crawford wrote an elaborate um, uh, notice, homesteading notice on the land, staking his claim. 
And then he also peeled the bark off of an aspen tree and wrote a second claim on the aspen tree for I think it was 160 <coughs> acres around the area. And so that would be the center of the tract. And that aspen was right near where the railroad would then be built after that. Um, so then he just had to convince his wife. So his wife at the time had a seven-year-old, a four-year-old, and a one-year-old child. And he was able to convince her that this was the place to be. So they made a very arduous journey out here. They had Indians that tried to rustle off their horses. They encountered quicksand. They encountered snow in the spring. For any of you who live here, we know what, what that's like, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Where did they come from? Um, from Missouri. Mm -hmm. Yes. And so she got them over here, and they ended up in Hot Sulphur Springs as kind of a base before they could get through the snows into Steamboat Springs. And so Mrs. Crawford, and they're trying to kind of raise the family, the kids are sick, they contracted scarlet fever because it was such a wet spring, she had to hang a wagon sheet over the children's bed to keep them safe and warm. They all survived, fortunately. But in the middle of the spring before the snows melted out, James Crawford heard there was gonna be a jump on his claim. And so he hopped on his horse, raced as best he could out to Steamboat, and on the way here, he had plenty of supplies. So there was a campsite where they were making flapjacks, and they ended up burning the flapjacks and throwing them in the snow as no good. They got out to Steamboat, he built a little kind of garden, and said, this is where the turnips are, and this is where the lettuce is, and that apparently is enough to show that you're improving the grounds in that is your space. So knowing that he secured the claim, they went back with very little supplies. And in fact, they were so hungry that when they got to the space where they had burned those flapjacks, oh. they ended up having to dig them out and eating them. Oh, yeah. And they said they were the best flapjacks they ever had. They were so hungry at that time. So they were able to get out here. They finally got all the children out here despite all the, the um, tragedies and everything that they had along the way. And when they got out here, there were the Ute Indians were still here. Mm -hmm. And so they decided that instead of taking the stance of being hostile with them, they wanted to be friendly with them. And so they gave them medical supplies and medical help whenever they could. Mrs. Crawford baked a ton of biscuits with molasses or sugar that they gave them that they liked a lot. Um, and they were able to build relationships with the Ute Indians. But that wasn't the same across Colorado. So south of here, there was the Meeker Massacre, um, in which the Native Americans rose up because their land and their ability to run was taken away from them in return for supplies. And because of that massacre, the Ute Indians were sort of banished and pushed off to Utah. And the Crawford family felt that loss, but it was also beneficial to them because without the Ute Indians here, it was actually more attractive for people, white people, to come out and settle and build the land and kind of make the dream that he had come true of this prosperous town. Um, and sorry, I'm just a little nervous still. So in 18... Oh, you're doing fine. Thank you, I appreciate that. Um, so in 1888, there was a brochure that was printed called Steamboat, the Future Metropolis of Route County. <laughs> it is a refuge for rest and retirement, a resort for pastime, a pleasure and a sanitarium for the weak and invalid. So they really believed that these springs had healing powers that were gonna spread across the country. And in 1889, the very first newspaper went to print, which was the pilot, which we still have today, the Steamboat Pilot and today. And they published an article called Largest Group of Mineral Springs in the World is at Steamboat Springs. <laughs> and so that's a history that not a lot of people know about. In 1900, the town was incorporated. And by 1902, we had four general stores, three banks, two dry goods stores, two newspapers, three livery stables. And this was starting to become a really thriving place. James Crawford initially wanted to build up the springs to a spa-like area, but he knew what he needed most was the train. So without a train, they weren't gonna have enough people coming in to wanna settle the area. So the townspeople of Steamboat raised about $50,000 to ensure that the train would make Steamboat a stop and not go north or south of here. In 1908, the train did come to town. That came with its own set of problems, as we'll talk about a little bit with the sad stories of the springs in a minute. But it did bring the visitors that they wanted, and it brought the tourists and the attractions that they needed. And so on their list of things to do to get this town ready for this influx of people was to build a modern hotel with 100 rooms, which they did. They wanted to build a bottling facility so that they could bottle, ship, and sell the carbonated waters that came out of the soda spring, which was a naturally carbonated spring. 
They were also going to build a handsome and modern bathhouse where the old town hot springs are. So they had a very rudimentary space there. And we'll talk a little bit more about how that expanded, but that was kind of a, a gathering place for the community. They wanted to set up precipitating tanks to save the sulfur coming off the sulfur springs. I'm not sure what that use was for, but that was part of their part of what they planned to do. And then they were going to pipe the hot water from the springs to heat the town. So they were going to pipe it underground, which is really interesting because we still look at thermal as a way to heat things today. Um, and in the five years following the train, there then became this huge boom of cattle, right? So at one point in 1902, there was 100,000 head of cattle and 20,000 head of horses. Mm -hmm. And they used to say that there was one blade of grass for every two cows. Mm -hmm. So oh. with that cattle, as they shipped the cattle out and they congregated down at the depot, they actually trampled and destroyed some of the springs that we have with the amount of it. Development is another big source of how we've lost some of our springs. Uh -huh. Talk a bit about those. So the most famous and probably the saddest story that we have, I'm doing all the sad ones first so we can get to the really exciting things after. But the saddest story we have is the Steamboat Spring. So the Steamboat Spring was first, um, first written about in 1839 and it was by a German doctor who accompanied a fur trading caravan and he describes it as quote, a warm spring that deserves special mention. The stream as thick as an arm spouts out in pulsations and runs into the river of the rock, which is coated with the oxide of iron and white crystals of salt. About six feet off are two smaller openings, one of which is obstructed while the other is still open. From the latter, there issues with a puffing noise, a gas mingled with vapor. This is somewhat pungent and benumbing odor. The puffing noise is deceptive. The puffing noise deceptively resembles the well-known sound of an engine, for which it is also known by the name of steamboat. Now that same spring also fooled a couple of fur traders coming through who heard that chugging and puffing noise and thought they had reached a major waterway with a steamboat on it, went running, steamboat by car, and they raced over there and found a geyser. <laughs> well, exciting and disappointing. So the geyser was believed to be Colorado's only geyser, and it used to puff up at different intervals. So it would come about four feet in the air, 10 feet in the air, and it actually sprang up to 15 feet in the air. The kids of town thought this was really cool, so they would throw rocks into the spring to watch the rocks shoot back up. But by doing that, they partially clogged the spring. Mm -hmm. So by the time the railroad was coming through, the spring was a little diminished, but was still in existence. So as the, if anyone, does everyone know where the steamboat spring is? Some of you do, some of you don't. So the steamboat spring is located right against um, a bed of rock that heads up like this. And the rock actually came out like this and they had to blast through the rock in order to get those last tracks into the depot and then onward. As they blasted through it, the rocks crashed down and cracked the basin of the steamboat spring. And that allowed the water to gush out and run into the river instead of being able to collect and pulse upward. So that day that brought so much tourism and brought what Steamboat wanted, we also lost in that day the Steamboat Spring, which is really unfortunate. Um, so that's sad story number one. Our other really, and this one is pretty heartbreaking as well, it's the Soda Spring. So the Soda Spring was a naturally carbonated water, and people used to come with the recipe for it, which you take two tablespoons of lemon syrup, a cup of fizzy water right from the spring and you had your own fizzy lemonade. The cabin hotel used to send guests over with a uh, wedge of lemon to go and do the same thing. So this was like considered, this was a pure water and unlike a lot of our other springs, it didn't have sulfur in it. So it didn't have that sulfuric taste which kind of puts a lot of people off. Um, and so it was really prized by the town. Unfortunately, when they built the highway the first time with development, the springs diminished a little, but they were still going. And then, um, oh, and I should talk a little bit about what it did because it was a very exciting spring. So it was quoted as saying, if judged by taste and effect, there is no superior in the world. It was supposed to be as good as better than any Pellegrino or Perrier that we have today. It was sparkling and highly effervescent, came from a large quantity of carbonic acid that was contained in it, and it had um, helped with digestive orders and things like disorders and things like that. So if you had a little gas in your belly, it would actually help you burp it up. Um, and it gave people the sensation of vigor and kind of exhilaration after drinking it. So there was this whole love of this spring. And then we have development. And so as the town gets bigger and bigger, 
the traffic starts to build up and the spring that's very close to the highway is now in the way of a potential expansion of the highway. Um, and so they, the officials say, and they wrote an article that was ironically titled, it won't hurt to move the springs, the officials say. And they had a whole plan for moving it. So they were going to cap the spring, they were going to pipe it through PVC piping so that there would be no bacteria that would grow in the water so it would still be safe to drink, and it was going to be great. And so they expanded the highway, they tried to pipe the spring, and the spring disappeared. So we no longer have that spring. There is some slightly sparkling water that trickles down into the Yampa River, but it's not, it does have that sulfur taste. So I have tried to taste as many of the springs as I can, and I have not been able to find this very pure, delicious water that we had. Lolita Crawford, who was related to James Crawford, the founder, she wrote a letter of protest, and her words we should remember today. She says that in the loud demands of the present, it is easy to sacrifice priceless natural treasures and the beauty that can never be regained. We have already wasted too much of our heritage. Let's not waste all of it. <laughs> so, you know, as we continue to develop steamboat, that's something we should all keep in mind about our heritage. And then we're going to start to get into the little more fun stories and the happier stories about our springs. So there is an iron spring that was also called the Heron Spring. And it was called that because Mrs. Crawford had this little baby heron that grew up. And as it grew up, it became very domesticated. And early in the morning when it was cool out, the little heron would swing with its long-legged gait down to the springs and just soak in the springs up to its legs until it warmed up out. And so that's how it got the name the Heron Spring. And the same heron would also follow Mrs. Crawford to church. And when it was ready, it would tap on the window of the church to let everyone know that it was there and ready to go. <laughs> and then we have our Big Lake Spring. So this is the spring that sits at our entrance to town and it looks like a lake. That is not actually one spring, but that is several springs all piped in together. Again, we felt like development was the best way to go. So the lands that used to be a marsh filled with all sorts of different springs, they decided it would be better as a recreation area for the town. So they piped about five different springs into this one big lake spring so that we could have a dry area to play on. One of those springs was called the Sweetwater Spring. Um, and it was had a sweet flavor, did have a little sulfur to it. And George Tolls, who really is has been the expert on the springs, on the water in Steamboat, and who was instrumental in my research for the book and for this talk, he said that if you look at that spring, there's about five areas where different bubbles come up out of it. And the strongest of those bubbles is a sweet water spring that's mm -hmm. still coming up. So as we where is that? So that's right as you come into town where the big elk is on Highway oh, 40. That's oh. the Big Lake Spring. Oh, okay. yeah. And then we have this little, not very well-known spring. It's called the Black Sulphur Spring. There's almost nothing that's been written about it. Nobody really knows what it does. It was at one point said to help your skin become smooth and soft. So if you had yellow splotches or dryness of the skin, you could put that on your face and it would turn this rose blush into your cheeks. Um, oh. But other than that, we don't know a lot about it. And for me, that's really interesting because I feel like there's probably a lot we can learn about it. Much like the springs that we lost, you know, there's information, there's a purpose that it's there, and there's something that it's serving within our ecosystem that we don't understand that is still ripe for knowledge. So that spring, even though it just kind of sits there, and it's right next to the railroad too, for some reason it has not disappeared, it has survived all these years. That's one that I'd love to know a little bit more about. Um, and so keep an eye on that one. Hopefully there'll be a scientist who comes in that says, I want to figure out more about why that's here and what purpose that serves. Then we have our Narcissus and Terrace Springs. So these actually come right out of the rock above the Yampa River across from the Bud Warner Memorial Library. And the, um, the one, the Narcissus, or actually, sorry, the Terrace Spring was had a very bitter taste to it due to the high quantity of sulfur and alkalis in it, but it was believed to have the highest percentage of soluble sulfur in any spring in Colorado, which is interesting. Um, the Narcissus Spring, on the other hand, is said to have iridescent blue, green, rose, and silver minerals in it. <coughs> and those were also said to treat skin disorder, disorders like eczema and things like that. So if you have it, instead of trying chemicals, we can try our springs. So the right here is a first stop, which I would encourage. 
Um, and then the sulfur. So we talk a lot about the sulfur. We have a lot of springs. The one that emanates the most, the strongest smell really, at least as far as proximity to the depot, is the sulfur spring. And that's the one that's got a lot of energy to it. It bubbles up a lot. This is the one that the first settlers used to bathe in. And they bathed in it, one, because it was warmer than the other springs, and they hadn't yet discovered the Old Town Hot Springs, so that was discovered a year after they lived here. But it also helped repel mosquitoes and other bugs, so it served a benefit. The Sulphur Spring is the same one that the Ute Indians used to bring their horses into before battle, and that they used to bathe in as soon as they arrived in the summertime. The elders would bathe in to help heal from a long journey. So there's a lot of history with that spring. It's a pretty cool spring. And it was once the most valuable spring in all of Steamboat Springs because of the many cures that it was credited of having for different diseases. Um, gout was supposed to be cured by it. Blood poisoning was supposed to be cured by it. And people with rheumatism used to talk about how they came here crippled and barely able to move and on their last legs of helplessness. They would bathe in the spring and then they would talk about their supple joints and the movement and how they were now free from pain and able to enjoy their lives again. And we have that resource right here sitting there. The city tells you they don't recommend bathing in it, but as far as I know, it's not illegal to take a bath in it. How hot is it? It's warm. I think that's 60 some degrees, yeah. So it's not hot, hot, but it's not cold and temperate. And then as we talk about the healing springs, we have to talk about the Lithia Spring or the Milk Spring. And this spring is tucked a little bit further out of town. So up off 13th Street, it's labeled, I think it's at Lithia Street is the name of it. So you go up there and the first thing you'll see are some stone posts with a G on the top. And that is for H.W. Gossard. He actually leased the springs from the city of Seaboat Springs for a time. But if you don't know, lithia is that substance that used, is used to treat manic depression. And at a time in 1867, according to the British Pharmacopoeia, lithia was believed to cure gout, rheumatism, arthritis, liver disorders, kidney disorders, and ease inflammation of the bones and joints, and also cure blood disorders. It was also once tested as a potential cure for schizophrenia and for alcoholism. The amounts that we have of lithia in this spring are minor amounts. So at high levels of, um, of lithia, it's not addictive, but you can see some side effects. Our water doesn't have high enough levels to cause those problems. But our old timers believe that if you drink a glass of that every single day, you're gonna be healthier, happier, and live longer. And they still do that. So I tried it, because I was like, well, you know, you gotta, gotta see what it's like. It does have a pretty strong sulfur smell to it. So what they do is they'll take a bottle or a container of it, let it sit in the refrigerator for a couple days so the sediment will kind of come down in it. And then you just squirt a little lemon or lime, which brings out the effervescence in the water, and you can drink it. And it's actually not bad, it's surprisingly not bad. Uh -huh. I, I can't say I would recommend for everyone to try it. There could be bacteria in it, so you do want to be careful of that, but old timers swear by it. And this was once, uh, so it is also the lightest metal in the periodic table. There are a couple other springs throughout the world. So there's a famous lithia spring in Saratoga. Our spring has seven times the lithia that their spring has. And we also have 40 times the lithia of Virginia's famous Buffalo lithia waters. So we are number oh. one. <laughs> um, so in the 1930s, this spring was leased along with the Old Town Hot Springs at the time to H.W. Gossard, who had recently retired from a successful corset business. And he so believed in these springs that he renamed them the Rocky Mountain Miracule Waters. And he bottled them. And he kept those springs throughout World War II. He even built guard towers to protect his springs. And he was so in love with these waters and so believed in the powers of them that he built a stainless steel container in the trunk of his car so that he could take gallons of water to California with him when he went for the winter time. Oh. So, it's pretty cool. And then he also, he was a very good marketer. So he was big for steamboats and he had signs put up at the front at both of the entrances to steamboat that said famous lithia waters with an arrow one way and steamboats famous hot springs and swimming pool with an arrow the other way. So that used to be the sign that greeted people when they came into town. And then there's this really interesting story about a man who just disappeared one day. And he was kind of a rowdy guy, and he used to spend a lot of times up at the Lithia Springs. 
So they went looking for him and they actually drained the springs, found his body in there, but they also found typewriters. And it turns out the kids from the high school used to steal the typewriters, probably not wanting to learn to type, and they would throw them into the springs <laughs> to get rid of them. So who knows what's hiding down there now? Oh, wow. Something to think about as you fill your drinks apart. <laughs> and then we have our Old Town Hot Springs. So these have been named a few things through the years. Initially, they were called the Bath Springs because people bathed in them. Then when H.W. Gossard took over, he called them the Heart Springs, because as I said, he was a very great marketer, and who doesn't want to sit in a Heart Spring? And now they're called the Old Town Hot Springs. So the Yampa Valley Curse may have actually begun at these springs. So the Ute Indians had a huge battle with the Arapaho Indians. The Arapahoes came and they attacked them while they were camped on an island at what was then called Bear River, but it's now called the Yampa River. And during this battle, Chief Yarmanite, who was chief of the youths for a long time when the Crawfords moved, first moved here, his father died in that battle. And the battle took place all up along the hills of those hot springs there. And Chief Yarmanite said that every year after that battle, because of his father's death, he felt it was his duty to come back and honor that place. So that may be the beginning of those pulls of the Yampa Valley curse of having to come back. And I know it well because I keep coming back every time I leave. Um, so this spring was discovered more than a year after the Crawfords moved here and it was discovered accidentally. James Crawford was out hunting and he was following a game trail down when he literally, his horse stumbled into a river and in the middle of that river, these warm waters came bubbling up. And he got off his horse and said, oh my gosh, that is perfect for bathing. So he rushed home, got his wife and children, brought them out, the children were allowed to bathe first, then the women bathed, and then the men bathed. And this became the place where anyone who visited the Crawfords, the first thing they asked them was, is, do you want to go and take a bath? Especially because of the long journeys. And people would come down from as far as Hans Peak to bathe in these waters. So they eventually developed them a little bit, built a bathhouse around them. And one of the things they used to do is they had separate rooms in the bathhouse. So you would get a key and you would go into a dressing room and you would wait until you were told. And once you were told, you could open your door, you'd have access to the bath water, you could take your bath, get out, get dressed, and then you would ring the manager of the building. He would take your key, make sure everything was locked up and proper, and go on to the next person. So people were able to have individual baths there. For a time, they also had an indoor pool that is no longer there, but the development of the Hot Springs has always been a community gathering place, and it remains that way today. When Gosser took over, he took the main spring and he built this heart-shaped pool around it, and that's where the name the Heart Spring comes from. It's not the same pool that we have today, but we still have a heart-shaped pool around the spring that you can bathe in, and that's the direct spring that's coming up out of the ground. So that's pretty fantastic. Um, and let's see. In 1931, there was actually a water carnival here, and famous swimmers from all across the country came out and swam and dove in our hot springs out here. And in fun, in the wintertime, people would ski down off the hill and ski across the waters. And they don't allow that anymore, unfortunately. It would be kind of fun. Um, and to attract attention, there was a carny called Ray Woods, and he would dive off of a 100-foot tower into the waters just to get people interested to coming in and pay their minimal amount to come and swim in the waters. In 1935, those springs got turned over to Health and Rec, and that's who's still developing them today. And so now we've got a climbing wall, we've got gym sessions, we've got slides, we've got bathing pools, and a swimming pool. So if you haven't been there, that is a great family space to go and spend an afternoon. Do they own the hill behind it, too? Mm -hmm. The hill behind it? I believe they do. Candace, do you know? Yeah. Um, what was the question? Do they, does the um, Health and Rec Center own the hill behind it? They do, they do right? and um, there, it's reported that the last Arapaho Youth Battle happened up above there, mm -hmm. and so um, it's chained off, and we have been sort of encouraging them to not develop up there. We got a call, actually, recently, saying, hey, you know, we'd like to do some yoga decks and different things like that. What is your feeling about, you know, a burial ground being up there? And, uh, <laughs> and my response was, if it were a Steamboat Springs Cemetery with, with gravestones, would you, I would just proceed 
similarly to that. Mm -hmm. And so, and they agreed. Um, right. So yes, they do own the whole hillside as far as, I'm, as, far as I know. Um, but I don't know how far up or what that property was. I think like, there is a, a chain link fence though. Yeah. And I think that would probably be at the property line. Okay, great. And then we have our other hot springs, our Strawberry Park Hot Springs, which is our least developed hot springs. It's beautiful out there. There's still no electricity. You can change in a teepee. Um, and this comes from, the name of the Strawberry Park Hot Springs actually comes from a little bit of confusion. There was once a sign that said Buffalo Pass, Strawberry Park, Hot Springs, three separate places. And people confused this, or blended the Strawberry Park and Hot Springs together to become the Strawberry Park Hot Springs. So that's how it has its name. And one of the cool things was when it, before it was totally developed, you could soft boil eggs in the water, you could steep your tea in the water, and you could cook fish and game in the water. So that's pretty neat. And apparently the eggs never got overcooked. You could, um, Mrs. Crawford would take a little dipper and she would bury the eggs down in the sand a little bit, and apparently within a half hour they would be soft boiled and ready for consumption. <laughs> And so there's about five different areas where the hot water comes out of the rocks to form those springs. And in the winter time before they were developed for about a quarter acre all around them, there was no snow because of the heat from the ground. So even in the winter time, there would be grasses and little blooms of flowers when there shouldn't be because of the heat that encouraged them to grow and live. They believed that that water was heated by radium. And so it offered healing effects and pain relief in the similar way that they believe radiant from x-rays would cure you. And I don't know if anyone knows, but they used to use x-rays to treat acne. I just watched a special on this recently of a woman who developed horrific cancer because as a child, she had really bad acne and they would x-ray her face over and over again to get rid of it. So they thought that it had the same power in our springs, fortunately nobody's died <laughs> from it. Our old timers who swim in the hot springs every day in the Old Town Hot Springs and Strawberry Park have lived very long lives. And there's actually a theory that it's the same water that runs along a fault line from the Strawberry Park Hot Springs into the Old, Old Town mm -hmm. Hot Springs. It's considered to be chemically pure water, so again, no sulfur in the water, which is really rare because the content is exactly the same in the two waters. That's where that theory comes from. Um, in the late, oh, and so in the winter, to get to those springs, you used to have to ski up to them, right? Mm -hmm. Now you can drive up to them, but it is treacherous. So if you don't have chains or snow tires, you will be fined if you slide off the road. So skiing may be a better option for you. But in the 70s and 80s, um, before they were really developed, there was an article in the Denver paper, and people started coming up because of that article to see how great these springs were. And when they came up, this is when the locals say that trash started getting left, mattresses were left, and people started not taking care of the springs the way the locals always had. It used to be you could ride your horses up there and camp up there, bring your dogs with you, and then it started getting trashed, and there was also a lot of nudity. And so it was so bad that the sheriffs were called out, and within a three-week period, they issued 23 tickets for nude bathing. And this was during the day. People just didn't care. So they ended up closing the area off, until in the 80s it was sold to Don Johnson who developed it. You can still swim nude, but it's an after nine o'clock thing. So if you wanna have family time, you can go out and have family time at nine o'clock. You can get a little crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and people have, they've had noise complaints and things like that, but it really is a place that is one of the most spectacular for me in the valley. And then we have this really cool spring. And if people have been following this story, this is why we really need to be careful about not losing our springs to development. So on the hill by Howlson Hill, there's the Sulphur Cave Spring. And if you go up there, there's kind of a limestone entrance and there's a little bit of water that trickles into it. And it's really hard to see into it, even with flashlights, it's hard to get a grip on it. But people like to explore as they do. And this entrance is filled with highly toxic hydrogen sulfide, carbon monoxide gases, and carbon dioxide. So if you go in without breathing apparatus, you will die. I mean, there's no way around it. And the oracles used to use sulfur vapors from caves like these to prophesy the future. But according to the Ute Indians, and a, a story that was written about, so this isn't verified by the Ute Indians, this is a white person writing this story. I just want to preface with that. Supposedly, this was the area where if you were condemned to death, this is where you were to die. And so once the Grand Council has decided your fate, you would be accompanied by six warriors with their right hands painted blood red. And for the victim, his arms would be tied above his head 
with the sinews of bison. And he would be holding, held by those and conducted to the mouth of, quote, this breathing monster where, the, um, where he was made to walk into it. And at the word of command, if he didn't walk into it, he would be shot with poison arrows that would give the most excruciating death. So it was either death by sulfur fumes or death by poison arrows. Um, so that's kind of the history, and either it would be terrible agony, I'm sure. But the scientists wanted to find out what was in this cave. And so they decided that to do that, they were going to have to pump out some of the toxic fumes of it, as well as wearing breathing apparatus. And in hydrogen sulfide caves, a safe level to be at is about 14 parts per million. They measured 35 parts per million in this cave, which means that your exposure needs to be for a very short time, because even with breathing apparatus, it can be harmful to you. So they found these very rare gypsum crystals where the bacteria metabolizes with the hydrogen sulfide gas and interacts with the limestone caves, but they also found snotites. And snotites, what? snotites. Snotites. Oh, so it's version. similar to stalocytes, but it's kind of like human snot, so it's kind of liquid and it moves with the weird things like that. And it's only been found in one other cave, and that's in Mexico. So that's really cool. But then they also found, and I'm going to read quite a bit of this because this is new information, so I'm not as familiar with it. But they found these little red worms in there. And they're about as thin as pencil lead and about an inch long. And they have now discovered that this is the only place on Earth that these worms exist. <laughs> so they have researched them for about eight years. They are blood red in color. And it says when David Steinman first crawled into the sulfur cave during the summer of 2007, he noticed these clumps of bright red colored worms living in the small stream that flows through the cave. He suspected that they could be a new species, and after eight years, they have been formally decided as a new species. And I'm trying to find where the name of them is because I will butcher the name as I find it, but it, part of it refers to the sulfur in the cave. Um, and he also thinks, and this is interesting, that they might live in the bedrock caves under the town. So I don't know if anybody else has heard the rumor that Steamboat sits on a series of crystal caves, but that apparently it is believed that there are bedrock caves and who knows what exactly is in under this town, which is pretty cool. These little guys, they cluster together and that's a very strange behavior for worms. So they're not sure if they cluster together because of the environment that they're in, because they have no natural predators, so it's safe for them to be in clusters in the open, or if it's a mating behavior. So that's something that they're still researching. Their hemoglobin-rich blood gives them a dark red color, and they think that it may have medical properties. So the ability to live without a lot of oxygen, they want to study that and see what that could possibly do for humans. And they think there might be new antibiotics that they can derive from these worms. So there are studies being done around the world right now on these little worms. And then there's a Dr. Olaf Gier, who is an expert on extreme aquatic habitats at the University of Hamburg in Germany. And he noted that the hydrogen sulfide levels in the sulfur cave stream are 10 times higher than those found at deep sea volcanic vent ecosystems. The sulfur cave worms survive by eating, oops, by eating sulfur oxidizing bacteria. They don't depend on the sun's energy, which is really strange. So that leads them to believe that there could be similar ecosystems on places like Mars, where in these caves, if there's some liquid, that these kind of worms could live. Um, and so they're doing more studies to figure this out at both in Denver and in Europe. So because of the things that they're finding in the sulfur cave, even as recently as now, this is my plea to you that in your hometowns, or if your hometown is steamboat, if there are places that are gonna be developed that may have some sort of purpose that we don't know, let's try and save them. So if there's a spring and we don't understand it, let's try and save it. If there's something unique to our area, let's try to save it. If there's something unique to your areas, I would really encourage you to try and save it and preserve it because who knows what secrets they hold. So that's my short talk on the springs. If anyone has questions, I am open for questions. Yeah. When did the Soda Springs go away? I think it was 1988 is when they expanded the highway. Mm -hmm. So fairly recently in our history. Mm -hmm. How hot? How hot is the hottest spring up in Strawberry Park? I 
think it comes out at 150 degrees is my understanding, but I would have to double check that. Okay, because I did, I volunteer at the front desk here, and someone told me a week or so ago that 140 some degrees, and I thought, wow, that's, that's I mean, that, you can't really go in there, can you? It, it, they mix it with the creek. Okay. Yeah. So they, oh. they control how it comes in and okay. how much water comes in from the creek. I remember a couple, many years ago when we were in a drought and by September the creek was barely running at all, mm -hmm. all of those springs were scalding. I mean, you really yeah, couldn't, you couldn't yeah. you, for like five minutes maybe, <laughs> and then the hottest one you couldn't, so we re they really rely on that creek um, flowing pretty well. Um, I brought up a couple of things if anybody wants to look, if this is okay with you. Um, so one of the things you may not be aware of is we have an archive here called the Route County Collection, which are newspaper clippings, documents, photos, you name it, um, that have been collected over the last hundred years or so. And one um, is the map that shows the Uray Spring, the Navajo Spring, and the Juanita Spring over in Fairview um, that I was mentioning. So I wanted you to take a look at that. Um, this was an article from 1949 saying group of mineral springs here cannot be duplicated in the world. So all the way up through 1950, that was the thought. Um, this one here is kind of a neat one talking about the waters of the marvelous healing of marvelous healing power. Duplicates of duplicates of all the famous springs of the world. And so that's kind of a neat article to look at. Um, and I should say that the majority of my research came from George Stolls and from the archives. We've right got now. a lot of good information. An um, and then this one's great um, because oh, we're going to continue cool. to deal with this. <laughs> It won't hurt to move the spring, so yeah, the officials right. say, so the soda yeah. spring. And um, the reason why I want to mention that we might continue to deal with this is um, the Iron Spring and the springs around 13th on this right side of the road, that's private property and which could be sold. And it's kind of a whole long story, um, but there, it's not only close enough to the conglomeration of springs all around the library, the depot, the sweet water, all of that. But it's also right below the Iron Spring Park, which is owned by the city. And so again, any development that would happen adjacent could disturb the Iron Spring, which has this really important history connected to the Crawford family because the first Crawford cabin was right above the Iron Spring. So we're not only talking the site of a historic, our first house in town of our founder, but we're also talking the spring that was very utilized by them. And so um, currently there are no regulations, and actually I've been researching regulations to protect springs. Mm -hmm. Rachel's been helping me with that. We can't find regulations to protect springs. So one of the things that I've been working on is working with the city to um, do ordinances to protect historic resources of any significance, but the springs would be at the top of that list. And the majority of them are owned by the city, but the difficulty is, and when you talked about this, is what goes on under the ground for the iron spring could be 100 yards away from it, but then the people that own that property are gonna to wanna to develop that in any way that they see fit. So what we're encouraging the city to do with developers is to do proper hydrology studies and geothermal studies to um, help protect them. How far that's gonna go, I'm not sure, but considering we've already ruined two um, of our major springs, our namesake springs, it's just, I think it's time to start looking. So anyway, that spring, it won't hurt to move the spring. They can't be moved. They can't be bottled. No, they can't right. be piped. No. They are this web. Um, and then this one's kind of interesting too. Steamboat could be a leading resort. Fort Collins business fan tells of great opportunities in store for this section of the state by developing natural resources. And this was from as far back as 1914. So anyway, those are up here if you're interested. Um, Danny, thank you so much. This was an incredible talk. Yes. Thank you.